Yeah. I was thinking you, you're both kind of well traveled. How many was it three different tracks that you were racing around? I was trying to remember. Yes, Hall, Hall, I, I started at Hall Green. I did, um, I worked at Hall Green for 18 years. Uh, went to Wimbledon for 10 and then Coventry for five. Now, be, I know you mentioned about closing them, but I just always have to point out they closed after I'd left. So I always would say that if I had remained, what would have happened? Maybe they might still be here. I'll be, uh, <laughs> I, I've actually never been at a dog track that's closed. I've always left before they've gone. So that's and sinking ships things to mind. But uh, you beat me to it, yeah. Yeah. And of course, Tony, you've. I was trying to think of the tracks that that you or obviously Jane now have been at. It being what Hall Green, Perry Bar, Monmore, two or three times. Perry, <laughs> Hall Green two or three <laughs> times. Oxford or Swindon. Uh, Swindon. Swindon. I started Coventry. Swindon, Coventry. Uh, um, I was probably, truth be known, I was probably in my happiest with when I was at Oxford. I was, and I only left Oxford because the GRA had asked me to go to Hall Green. Yeah. Uh, That'll teach you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll never learn. <clears throat> what was it you particularly liked about Oxford? Um, the devilment. There was quite a bit of devilment there. There was a few, uh, well, it was a bit like Hall Green and the Bertie Gaynor, Jeffrey, Paddy Hancock. So there were some schemers there. Um, well, you fitted well in then. I've never, <laughs> been, I've never been a schemer, Floyd. Uh, I started off thinking I was a schemer and done it wrong every time. So I decided, no, that wasn't my way. I'll. Uh, I'd be happy with my judgment if uh, if I fancied a dog, it was because I could see him winning, not because I'd done anything, any skullduggery to stop him performing before, because I was useless at it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's in Oxford, you could get in, in the uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, you could get fortunes on. Yeah thousands tens of thousands of pounds would be would change and on some races and uh, they wouldn't bat an eyelid the book is that would have been kind of the uh, gary wiltshire era wouldn't it uh gary would come in latish on yes um i can't even remember the name of the book is there the racing manager was mick weeble yeah um formerly of leicester wasn't it yeah, he was it. Yes, he was. Leicester. Yeah. yeah. Again, Mick, Mick he, he, he was he was quite a shrewd as a race manager, but you'd need you'd need a kind of a good ringmaster given some of the stuff that was going on there. Yeah, yeah. They uh, um, he just used to keep an eye on it, and I think uh, a bit of devilment come in, and he 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 work out one or two that were being plotted and stick them in together so as the plotters didn't know what to do um but it was it was a great track for gambles yeah and your time as race manager simon of as we, we talked about hall green um there were a few at wimbledon that were well, one in particular that that um was particularly prone to uh, a bit of a, a, a tilt at Mr. Morris, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'm sure you mean uh, a gentleman whose initials are TD. Um, <laughs> he, he absolutely <laughs> loves it. I know he relishes it. I, I think he's got something in his kennel sort of uh, reminding everybody of uh, what a bane he was to bookmakers. Yes, he's got the sign up that says these kennels were built by the Wimble the Wembley Stadium bookmakers or something along that lines. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean. Wimbledon, I mean, the class of trainer there was unbelievable when I went and, and over the years we, we done and added to that with, I mean, don't forget Owen McKenna was at Wimbledon for a certain period of time. Um, it didn't work out for him because we sort of, it was a love-hate relationship. I loved having him there, but he didn't, Owen hated going. He, he had to come a long way from John Coleman's kennel. He, Owen didn't suit the style of grading that we did. He 
wanted to, ha- and he, he said it in 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 before that he he thought he should have more control over where his dogs run rather than the grader. But that was fine. I guess back to 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 the the, the shrewdies at Wimbledon. You could grade a card, and we were always badgered, oh, try and make it send the two to the field. But if you had six different trainers with dogs that were all identical, but Terry Dartnell got my dog would not start seven to two. It's as simple as that. The tissue would go up, and it'd be six to four, purely and simply his name. And then somebody else, Dave Kinship, Mary Harden, there's a before five to one because they weren't a gambling kennel. Yeah. But talking to somebody like Tony Morris, in the end, he said, I'm not bothered about seven to two the field. He said, if something looks like a six to four, five to four, even money shot, that's fine by me because we'll frame the market around that. Yes. He said, well, I doubt it's seven to two the field and something is plundered on because it's far better than seven to two. In view of how things have, have kind of gone now in terms of um, percentages with, with lots of safety margin built in and the fact that there are so many restrictions now on, in terms of people having a punt. Do you think we've lost something as an industry? Yeah, because obviously when you think back to the, the glory days of uh, the bookmakers against the punters, uh, it was all cash betting. Um, it was the black market money. You know, if you're a car dealer and you've had a good week, you don't want to be putting 10 grand in the bank. You probably come down dogs to try and make it um, in something else and, and do it that way. Um Bookmakers were sadly were dying out, and and you you won't see the likes of Tony Morris, Dale Nash, and people like that again because, I mean, I mean Tony was a, a, a you know, and then you go into the John Power and all those, it it, it was a it was the cut and thrust of it, wasn't it? It's, you'd see the punters lined up in front waiting for a dog to go from seven to two to four to one. That was the fine margin in those days. Then. The money would go with one bookmaker and they'd be looking to lay it off down the line. Well, obviously, we bet fair and all that. That that was the, the first thing that um, sort of made it difficult for bookmakers because a bookmaker might take a bet and he'd lay it off on bet fair rather than sharing it out along the lines. And you can probably remember when I was a Hall Green and Mobiles were first coming on the scene, we actually used to have a, a notice in the race card that mobile cellular phones were not allowed in the stadium because obviously it was then tempting to, to start betting on, on, on off course rather than with the stadium bookmakers. The stadium bookmakers didn't want the money going. They wanted it staying at the track. Yeah. You, uh, you were never particularly a gambling kennel, were you, Tony? My father. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to like a punt. Uh, I think my biggest bet was a grand. Yeah. Uh, but you kept it very discreet then, because you, you weren't recognised as being a punting kennel. No, no, no. Well, um, uh, my next door neighbour used to get the money on for us, Johnny Jones. Um, but with my father, he bet in every race and uh, he couldn't help it. But uh, um, we like to punt. I remember a story. I went to Wembley fancying a dog one day and I had a, I had a grand on him. It's... Um, four to one with John Power. And all of a sudden there was fortunes for another dog in the race. And our dog was pushed out to 10 to one. <laughs> and John Power shouted to me, do you want it again? And I said, well, yeah, I'll have another grand with you, but I can't pay it tonight. You'll have to wait for your money. And he went, that's okay. And sure enough, our dog duly landed the uh, won the race and John Paris said, well, he come, he called me over, paid me the money, took me into the bar, bought me a bottle of champagne and uh, actually said to me, he said, we've had a great race. He said, your dog winning that done us a favour. Really? Who was the other dog? Can you remember? I can't remember. I got a feeling it was one of John Coleman's, but I, um, I honestly cannot remember. Yeah, I remember our dog. It was Kim Rocket. Of course, the, the the stayer. Yeah, yeah. I remember, remember. I say him. It was a yeah, dog. him. Yeah, because yeah. I was mixing up with Princess, of course, because she was first, wasn't she, Princess? That was Kim Rocket's mother. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I remember. I remember seeing her win at Romford, and I, I saw him one. 
I think he, I saw him when what, six forty, six eighty, six by five. He, he was he was a very very good strong dog, wasn't he? Nineteen eighty five yeah. Golden Jacket winner. Yeah, yeah. It's Hall Green. Yeah, <laughs> the only time it ran at Hall Green in the snow. Yeah, terrible night, wasn't it? Absolutely. No, Skirlow champ never turned up, did he? I was gutted. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Skirlow, uh, Ken Peckham, only got to uh, by Derek Law's place and he pulled off and said to Derek, can I come and watch the golden jacket with you? And Derek had actually bet our dog, because we told him we thought we'd win it. We'd, and Skurlog had only really just started to uh, um, win all around him. And uh, of course, so Ken Peck had to sit there watching Derek cheering and shouting and what a dog. <laughs> It was a strange one that um, Gary Newborn got ITV involved and we ran the meeting, uh, I think about three races on their central sport programme, about half six on, on the evening. And the weather was unbelievable. I mean, any time now, you just would have given up about two o'clock and said, oh, we run it another day. But we was, I think the GRA was so desperate to get any sort of mainstream television coverage uh, I think we had a hurdle race and the, certainly the Golden Jacket final, but it was unbelievable. About, there was about a foot of snow by the time we came to race and dogs were rolling up virtually 10 minutes to the off and Frank Melville gave everybody dispensation to race and they sort of came in, went in the kennel, came back out and went out to race. But uh, you, you, you give up hours before, you just wouldn't even contemplate it now. But it was just, again, to be so desperate to get the meeting on.